recording in progress. We'll pause the recording until we're ready to go. All right. So um, this morning, I want to share some some takeaways. And of course, you know, Rye and Chris, feel free to jump in at any time to, to share, you know, nuggets as well. But we we were immersed into three full days from 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Just every single minute of that was jam-packed with unpacking this workbook, which was only given to 215 of us total. So there's only 215 copies in existence. This is the latest, greatest revisions of where Phil Jones has taken his exactly what to say formulas and really broke down like the line of questions, the thought process behind them, why we ask certain questions and put them in an order that makes them the most useful to start getting used to learning, okay? And he taught us the four cornerstones, the four, the four cornerstones of understanding, like preparation is everything. Um, in fact, the four cornerstones, the very first one is the worst time to think about what you're saying is when you're actually saying it, okay? There's no substitute for preparation, and this is going to take a lot of practice, and this is something that none of us are going to learn overnight. Um, I got a tremendous amount of sales experience, so does Chris and Rye, and this stuff still is like, holy smokes, it's, it's switching up how we would ask questions and it's doing it in a way that is going to create deeper relationships you're going to really find out more of the context of what is important to your clients and how to get movement with decisions how to get movement with helping people decide um, approaching each conversation with curiosity which is actually one of the other cornerstones. Number two, curiosity is the fuel for great conversations. And what I mean by that is like literally, and I know you've heard me say this at least a hundred times, be curious like a five-year-old. No judgment, no preconceived assumptions, like throw all that out the window because we don't know what our clients are really thinking until we ask. And when you ask these questions, it's gonna help you build a stack of evidence to know what is important to your client. And if they get stuck, you can reference that stack of evidence, you know, based on the fact that you told me that having three bedrooms was absolutely critical to your family's happiness because you've got another child on the way and settling for a two bedroom is not gonna work. What are we gonna do about your budget to figure this stuff out? You know, like if you can't say be, because of the fact that you said, X, Y, and Z, and be able to use that to help your clients make decisions. Maybe we haven't asked enough questions yet to get to know our client better. Okay. Um, glad you're able to come in here, Verse. Um, number three cornerstone is people do things for their own reasons, not yours, not mine, for their reasons. So when you understand the context of their reasons, for why they wanna do something or, or the decision that they're contemplating, you can help make movement in that momentum by asking questions and reflecting back as a mirror what you've learned that's very important to your client. I'm gonna share with you guys how I used this yesterday in a workshop here in a moment as an example. Uh, the person asking the questions, this is cornerstone number four, the person asking the questions controls the conversation. This one here, I need a lot of practice. And I'm noticing, and I noticed it so many times since last week, and in almost every conversation since, and in negotiations, it, it just keeps coming up where somebody will ask me a question, and I feel compelled to give them an answer, because I have programmed myself to be the answer man, to, to be the resource, to give people answers. I even noticed it at the 4th of July barbecue as I'm getting to know some of my neighbors and they were saying certain things 
And instead of me asking questions to qualify more and practice this stuff, um, I started giving answers. And I noticed that sometimes when I was giving answers, the it wasn't landing well. I thought it was a great answer, but it wasn't really what they were looking for. And when I went back to asking questions and asking more questions and asking more questions, they I noticed their body language changed. They leaned in. We were having conversations. So even just whether it's personal, real estate, leadership, professional, practice asking a lot of questions. Even when somebody asks a question, and I've been playing with this, like when people ask, how many offers do you have on such and such? Like that's their text. Hi, Michael. You know, with regard to such and such property, how many offers do you have? Well, the old me, the very well ingrained, do it like I've always done it me. Oh, we have such and such offers. Da, 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 da. What do you got for me? Well, now I'm like, uh-uh. Now I just ask, answer the question with a question. And it's funny. Nobody's getting upset. They're giving more more information. And I'm able to shape conversations and shape negotiations differently because I'm just practicing what we're learning, which is when they're asking, you know, how many offers do you have? Why do you ask? <laughs> you know, and then it's funny because the different answers tell me they're just testing the waters. They really have an interested party. This could be something serious. This is totally, you know, somebody who hasn't even read anything. And then I ask more questions and guide the conversation to get them what they need and be able to move on. But it's it's creating more fruitful conversations by flipping it around and taking control of the conversation by answering a question with a question, okay? There are um, a line of questions that literally there's 32 questions for exactly what to say, okay? These 32 questions, we also have an outline to make it easy to start practicing. So there's rejection-free openings. Rejection-free openings are like something that you want to start a conversation where you have a mutually agreeable fact. You have a polite opening, a mutually agreeable fact, and it is followed up with a very easy to answer question that is a reflex question. And when we started breaking apart, learning this stuff, what was interesting, what was interesting is um, like how programmed most of us are to ask questions in a way to get what we want, not necessarily ask questions to seek to understand. And it was so interesting how when we were given the task of practicing these objection-free openings and asking a very easy to un a very easy to respond, reflect, you know, with reflex, a yes or no, or be able to stoke an answer to at least start gaining the permission to have a conversation. It was funny how many of us, myself included had such a hard time with an easy to answer question. So I've been having to practice that. Um, and what I'll do is I'm gonna use like what I did for some practice yesterday, because one of our assignments was to take questions one through 18. So it's, I'm not, I'm not sure if it's for you, but now instead of emphasizing, but because when you emphasize, but whatever you said before that gets wiped yeah. out. That's the key it, though, guys, too. You have to understand the but is just there to, get them to the next side, not to throw out the, the back end. Because everybody exactly. did that at the, at the course. Everybody's like, but, and they're like, no, 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 don't emphasize the but. You just want the next thing to be something they say yes to or they can, they can respond to. Exactly. And so, like, for instance, um, so this is, this is an example of, so questions one through 18, I'm not sure if it's for you, but the next one is open-minded. Like, would you be open-minded or how open-minded are you about blah, blah, blah? Who do you know? Like, who do you know that's done X, Y, and Z? Because I want to qualify and find out, you know, 
who do they know that's done something like this? Because they may have learned some things, good, bad, or indifferent, that's influencing their thought process, okay? And that's where as we started breaking these things down, and I started practicing with this yesterday on a home buyer workshop, and then I also practiced for what I'm going to share with you on talking to the investors who have not been listening to us on how to manage their projects and get higher profits for their sales. Um, opening fact question. An opening fact question is, again, like a, a polite opening, a mutually agreeable fact, meaning something that we commonly can verify or know as fact with a very easy to answer question in order to, again, I wanna stoke some conversation. Then we get into perspective changes, which is to start to build the body of evidence that we're going to use later in the conversation and questions and, and help guide the conversation better. So perspective changes are like, what do you understand about X, Y, and Z? Number six is, what is your experience with X, Y, and Z? Number seven, how certain are you that blank, 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 blank? Number eight, when was the last time you blank, 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 blank? Number nine, how important is it to you that you get this boom, boom, boom outcome? And then when they answer, okay, no, like seriously qualify that. On a scale of one to 10, one being this, 10 being that, where are you at on the scale? So I really want to understand how important this is to you. Number 10, could it be possible? This is to start getting them thinking outside the box. Could it be possible that there is some other option available? Number 11, how would you feel if boom, boom, boom? We want to start creating the where, where and find out what are the feelings associated with that particular possible outcome? Just imagine, now we're going to start forwarding the action. Just imagine if you were in your new home, enjoying this, da, 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 to get the feelings. Because when people feel good about something, that's when they're going to take action. If they don't feel good about it, they're not taking any action. An if-then statement. You know, if you trust me to do this, then I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, you're going to be so thankful that you allowed me to do this with you. Um, assumption frames. You know, when would be a good time, and I use this a lot for scheduling appointments, when would be a good time for us to continue the discussion about X, Y, and Z? When would it be a good time for us to book this workshop? It's an assumptive close. I'm guessing you haven't gotten around to X, Y, and Z. How often is it we give stuff to clients that haven't done it? I'm guessing you haven't gotten around to blah, blah, blah. You give them a, an out and then permission to go ahead and move forward with something. Let them off the hook. Number 16, you have three options. And the three options you want to give them is option number one, totally horrible, bad for them, not a good way to go. Option two, keep doing what you've always done, get what you always got. You already told me this isn't working for you, so are you really going to continue doing that? Option three, here's the unanimously, because the fact you said X, Y, and Z was important to you, like this decision would be like crazy for you not to move forward with, okay? And there's two types of people. And I bet you're a bit like me and something that can create some commonality in order to really start to stoke things and summarize it. There's still 19 through 32 to go through. But the initial practice to start getting used to this line of questions is like what I did with the investor and like what I did with the home buyer workshop yesterday. So I'm going to read to you. It's starting with one through 18 on the, I'm not sure it's for you, but all the way through and like how I frame these conversations. And I'm performing this, by the way, for the first time for you to see how this lands, to see if I'm going to edit some of this stuff and go back and try again. Because what you want to do is first practice writing out the questions. And that's it. Then you want to practice performing the questions out loud, especially with peers, just like this, to get feedback on, hey, that sounded funky. You might want to change this, this, and this. Or, damn, that was good. Roll with that. Or whatever in between, right? And then go back and edit it. And then perform it again, 
edit it, perform it again, edit it, because it's the performance of practice, meaning practicing, you will get very good at it. Then it becomes natural in the delivery, and there's different inflection points, different pauses, because you can, you can say the same words in a sentence, and when you change where you pause, how you inflect, what, what words you emphasize, completely changes how something lands. So, you know, like, you know, what were you thinking about when you were trying to decide blah, 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 versus what were you thinking? See the difference? So performance, and, and what's funny is like, it's now making sense like, oh, this is why in certain situations, I'm like totally knocking it out of the park. And then other situations, my performance sucks. And then I fall and crash and it doesn't go well. So first is going to be in these investors. So to set the stage, the investors that we bring a lot of deals to, you know, they have their own project managers. They do things all the way up to the last minute. They throw a pile on us and they expect us to just jump and get things done. They don't listen to us on pricing the homes. And What's happening is their listings are taking two to three times longer to go pending, and they're pending at ten to fifty thousand dollars per listing less than my other listings because they don't listen to me about changing their process. So I want to have a conversation with the senior VP, and here's the questions I'm going to ask him. I'm not sure if it's for you, but we've been netting tens of thousands more for our clients on other listings and selling faster with half the days on market. Profit is most important to you, right? That's my little easy to answer question. Either profit's more impo most important to them or it's not. The answer will tell me where their heads are at. Is it really the most important or is it really not? Because if it isn't, that's okay. You guys are leaving money on the table. You're comfortable with it. Or maybe it is important and we need to have this conversation. Okay. I'm adding context of where this could go. The next question, would you be open-minded? Would you be open-minded to learning ways you can increase profits is one way to perform it. Or would you be open-minded to learning ways you can increase profits? See how that's a little different and looking for what's going to really emphasize. Would you be open-minded to learning ways you can increase profits? You know, I'm just curious. And then the who do you know? Who do you know? that's averaging 108 to 111% list to sale and with an average day, average days on market of eight. This is my first time performing it. So I can already hear how I'm stumbling. It doesn't sound right. You know what I mean? Like it's very different than who do you know that's averaging 108 to 111% list to sale ratio and averaging eight days on market. Very different when I come across confident and asking that. And that question may or may not be what I want to ask them. I could even ask them, you know, who do you know that's absolutely crushing it in the market, selling for way more than any other agent in the industry? Maybe they know, maybe they don't. I just want to get them thinking. Um, now, this is an opening fact question. So this one was a fun one. We recently netted you 50,000 more profit than projected on the Crockett listing and $17,000 more profit on the next highest offer on the Camelback sale. You know, would you agree that helps your that helps your company? You know, we netted you 50,000 more profit than you projected on the Crockett listing and we netted you $17,000 more than the next highest offer through negotiations on the Camelback sale. Would you agree that that helps your company? I'm, I'm doing it just very easy. Is that a yes or a no? You know? And if he says no, that doesn't help his company, I would be shocked. I'm expecting a yes from that answer because I know that profits are important to them and they're hunting for deals left and right. But what do you understand? What do you understand about how we did that on those two sales? I want to know 
does he really understand what we did in order to get them 50,000 more than their projected profit on one that Eric didn't even believe that we would do. And then we performed and did it. And they were supposed to give us four more listings and they only gave us one. You know, I want them to understand, yo, you need to listen. So what is your experience with? What is your experience with high performing professionals like us? I, I really want to know, like, is he, is he, stuck in his ways because they work with a bunch of realtors that are order takers and don't give them guidance and feedback and pushback and kick them around to have them understand where they're losing money left and right because they're not listening. The how certain are you question? How certain are you that the way you're doing things is the most profitable? And if he says, oh yeah, definitely. Okay, well, like on a scale of one to 10, like one being, yeah, I think it's the most profitable to 10. Like I am absolutely certain our way is more profitable than any other way humanly possible. There's no other way that's better. Like, where are you at on that scale? Okay. Another, how certain are you? How certain are you that transparent pricing is the most profitable way to sell homes? Like seriously, a scale of one to 10. One being like, I, I'm kind of maybe certain to 10 being like, I'm absolutely certain this is absolutely the best way to go. It's absolutely nuts to do anything beyond transparent pricing. Then the, when was the last time someone in the Bay Area? Uh, when was the last time? When was the last time someone in the Bay Area market has brought up price and a challenge getting your home sold? Because I wanna know, this is starting to build the stack of evidence because I know for a fact that all their listings in the Bay Area are sitting for two or three times longer, having trouble moving because um, their project managers are sharing this info with me. But I don't know if he knows this. And when was the last time somebody brought to your attention challenges with moving product in the Bay Area? Because I'm now stacking more evidence of when you tell me when was the last time somebody told you. And then I ask you, um, you know, more and more evidence to stack up of like, dude, are you not hearing that? It's not just me. Like, there's a lot more people here that understand this Bay Area market that are trying to tell you to stop doing what you're doing because you're losing money. I got to run, Michael, your host, though. I got my meeting at 10. Coolio. All right.